Upanishad Communion in Harmony I have spoken on various aspects of reincarnation. Now, beginning a new series of talks, the word Upanishad is a very ancient word. It has its origin in Sanskrit language. The word itself, Upanishad, is beautiful and secret. It carries in its womb a great meaning. It simply means sitting close to a master. It comes from three syllables, Upa, Ni and Sha. Upa means to sit. Ni means close. And Shad is a verb that completes the two other syllables to give it a meaning. Why would you sit close to a person? Are you going to gain anything? First of all, there has to be love. There has to be a harmony. And when these two things are there, a communion happens. Remember, Master is living in wholeness here now. He is pulsating this very moment. His life has a music. It has a manifestation of joy. Silence which is of immense depth, full of light, and light overflows in myriad ways. The light overflows in myriad ways. Just as when sun is rising, there is tremendous beauty in it. It is free from ultraviolet rays. Firstly, it has beauty. Then, it has a lustre. It has a different kind of warmth. A deep penetrating warmth. When you come in front of the rising sun, you are transported in a different world of days ago. And if you happen to be by the seaside and you see the reflection of the sun in the water and you just imbibe this silence, this harmony, this overflow, the sun is not saying anything to you, you are not saying anything, but still a communion is happening. Therefore, Upanishad means just sitting silently by the side of the Master is enough. Nothing else is needed. Because the presence of the Master or the awakened one is contagious. The presence this presence is over, overwhelming. His silence starts reaching to your very heart as words overflow. Whether he remains silent or he overflows, it is everything, the presence, the words, the gaps, the selection of the words, the spaces between the two, all communicate silence and harmony. 
and this presence thus becomes a magnetic pull on you. It pulls you from the state of Kogmaya of the past and the future and brings you to the very moment, to the present moment. Upanishad is a communion, not a communication. There is a vast difference between the two. A communication is head to head and communion is heart to heart. This is one of the greatest secrets of the spiritual life. When you come in the company of a sheikh and tawajjo or the energy field flows, but it happens sometimes you cannot understand, decipher the silence. Then an explanation of silence sometimes becomes necessary. Nowhere else, at no other time, it was understood as deeply as in the times of Upanishad. Therefore, Upanishads are sacred and pure because these are the statements of truth experienced by the awakened one and these he intends to share with the disciples in close circle. The Upanishads were born nearly 5000 years before. A secret communion, a sacred transmission beyond the scriptures and beyond words, a statement of truth beyond the finiteness of the words is what Upanishad is. Sitting silently, not just listening to the words, instead listening to the presence as well. The words are only excuse or medium to transmit silence. The silence is the real content. The words are the containers to carry the message. If you become too much interested in the words, you will miss the presence of the being of the Master. If you listen to these messages with your eyes closed and using a headphone, you will get a, you will be transported in a totally a different kind of realm where Mind is not operating, heart is ecstatic and it drowns into that bliss. Therefore, never be too much interested in the words. Each word as it overflows, it has a heartbeat, heartbeat of the Word. I'm sure you have never heard this word. Heartbeat of the word? Yes. Each word is alive and anything that is alive, it has a heartbeat. When a master speaks, those words are coming from the innermost core. They are full of his color, of his light. They carry the taste of the fragrance of his being. If you are open and vulnerable, receptive and welcoming, the fragrance will penetrate into your heart and a process is triggered. Swedish psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung 
calls this synchronicity. It explains exactly what happens between a master and a disciple. It is not same as what happens between a teacher and a student. There is a difference between the two. Between the teacher and a student, a communication happens. Certain information is transferred from the teacher to the student. But in this process, transformation does not happen. The teacher himself may not be transformed. He himself has not arrived. He is repeating the words from other teachers. He may be even repeating the words from other masters as well. But he has not experienced these on his own. His words are borrowed. He may be very scholarly, he may be very well informed, but that is not the real thing. Information is not real thing. The real thing is transformation. And unless one is transformed, he cannot trigger the process of transformation in the other. Only one who has known can really create the magic of transformation. And Carl Gustav Jung calls this magic as synchronicity. The master cannot cause your enlightenment. Certainly, enlightenment is not a scientific process. It is very poetic, beyond the laws of cause and effect. It is far more liquid and flowing. The Master cannot cause enlightenment to happen in you, but he can trigger the process as the catalyst does in a chemical reaction. What is the role of a catalyst in a reaction? It simply activates the process of the chemical reaction. Itself it remains neutral and when a master triggers the process and that too only if you allow, allow the process to trigger in you. How can it be possible? Nothing can be done to you unless you are totally receptive and ready. This can happen only in a state of love affair. Indeed, master-disciple is a love affair. What is the role of the catalyst? You will recall the Sufi story which I have mentioned time and again. A master was leaving his body he wanted his disciples, three disciples, whom he loved, but they did not grow enough. He wanted them to find a suitable master after he is no more. So he left something for them, seventeen camels to be divided among the three in a particular way. It became a riddle. The first one gets the half of the camel, the second gets the one-third of the camels, seventeen camels. 
first one gets half of 17 camels, 7 gets the one third of 17 camels and the remaining two goes to the last one. Camel is not something that can be divided. It is a living organism. He went from learned people, different ones, but no one could solve this riddle. And the master had said, one who can divide, solve this riddle and divide the seventeen camels according to this bequit will be your master. Nobody could solve this riddle. Ultimately, he reached to a sheikh. When these disciples mentioned to the sheikh the, about the riddle and the wish of the master, he said, there is no problem in this. I can solve this riddle. As for the will of the master. You have seventeen camels and I have one. I will add one of my camels to your existing number of seventeen camels. Now that makes the total number of camels eighteen. The master said the first one gets half of the camels. So half of 18 is 9 camels. The first one he addressed, you take your 9 camels and you can go. The second one was supposed to get one third of the camels. So one third of the camels, total number of 18 is 6. You take your six and you go. So the first one gets nine, the second gets six. Nine and six is fifteen. And total number of camels to be divided was seventeen. And the master said the remaining two goes to the third one. So the sheikh said, I take back my camel. Now the nine is gone and six is gone. Only two have remained. The two goes to the third one. What does this riddle explain? It explains the role of a catalyst that master is. He does not do anything. He simply allows his presence surrounding you like a placenta. In mother's womb there is a fluid. You are connected through the umbilical cord and you float in the placenta harmlessly joyfully being nourished and nurtured every moment and this is what the master does he provides his presence the presence acts as a catalyst makes the things convenient and easy for you to grow and the moment the chemical reaction, the alchemical process of transformation is complete, he withdraws, he takes back his camel, he takes back his presence so that your own wings can grow, your own presence can grow. You can 
live now on your own energy. You do not need a spoon feeding, you do not need to hold on somebody's hands to walk on. He is surrounded. So between the teacher and the student there is a business whereas this between the master and the disciple there is love of fear. The disciple is surrendered. This is the meaning of sitting down. How can you sit down in presence of someone? Unless you are surrendered, you are so much overwhelmed by the presence that surrounds him that there is love, there is respect, you are being pulled towards it and you sit in a state of reverence. Disciple is surrendered and that is the meaning, that is the way you sit down. He is surrendered he has put his ego aside, he is simply open, there is tremendous trust. Of course, doubt will hinder the process. Doubt is no more, instead there is a loving trust, a trust that is loving. Indeed, with master doubt, is a hindrance. It is not of asking a question. Instead, the question has been transformed into a quest of the soul. Questions arise out of the mind and quest is a thirst that is of the soul. It is Inquiry of the heart, not an intellectual curiosity. It is a question of life and death. When one is tired of all questions and all answers, all philosophy, only then one is ready to come to a master. When one has accumulated much information, and still remains ignorant and all that information does not create any light within any ripple within the soul then he comes to a master to sit by his side to imbibe his presence questions are no more he knows now one thing, that all questions are futile. He has tried and has seen the whole futility of it. Now he sits in silence, open, available and receptive like a womb. The disciple becomes feminine. And only in those feminine moments, the master without any effort on his part starts filling the disciple. This happens spontaneously and naturally. Both the, both the disciple and the master are not doing anything. Instead, in, they are in a state of being, the master is being himself and the disciple is open. When your nose is not closed by cold and you pass by the sight of the flower, suddenly the fragrance of the flower is filled. 
spirit. Flower is not doing anything on its part in particular. It is natural for the flower to release its fragrance and on your part you are open to receive. You will smell the fragrance. The word Upanishad means coming to a master and one comes to a master only when one is tired of all kinds of teachings, dogmas, creeds, philosophies, ideologies and religions. And the way to come to the master is surrender. Surrender has two things. It has love and harmony. When love and harmony blend together, surrender is born. Not that your being is surrendered, only the ego, the false idea that you are somebody. Somebody is special and you know your scriptures. The moment this happens, you can, you, the doors are open for you. The moment you put the idea of ego aside, by simply saying that I know nothing, whatsoever I have known so far has not helped me in any way. I have gained university degrees, I have learned this and that, but nothing has helped me to attain to inner harmony and bliss. Ego is put aside, doors are open. Suddenly the wind, the rain, the sun and the Master's presence will start entering in you. This will create a new dance in your life. It will give you a new sense of poetry, mystery and music. And these put together is synchronicity. The Master is breathing in a certain rhythm. He is dancing on a certain plane, if you are ready, the same dance starts happening to you in the beginning, only a little bit. And that little bit is contagious and is enough. In the beginning, only the dew drops, but soon those dew drops become ocean. If you pay attention to these words, there is no philosophy in it. Ordinary words arrange in a particular, musically arrange in a particular raga to reach to your heart, to pose something that these words carry. The aliveness of these words are poured into you. Once you have tasted the joy of being open, you can no more be closed again. You have tasted something. First, only a window or the door opens, then you are open from all sides. All your windows and the doors are open and a moment comes in life of the disciple when not only windows and doors are open, even the walls disappear. He is totally open and available in his multi-dimensionality. 
This is the meaning of the word Upanishad. Upanishads are written in Sanskrit language. Sanskrit is the oldest language. The very word Sanskrit means transformed, adorned, crowned, decorated, refined. But remember the word transformed. The language itself was transformed because so many people attained to the ultimate. And because they were using the language, something of the joy, something of their joy, their presence penetrated into the language. Something of their poetry entered into the very sense, the very fiber of the language in the process with the passage of time, even the language became transformed and illuminated. This is the beauty of the language, Sanskrit. It happened 5000 years before in India with Sanskrit. So many people became enlightened and they were all speaking the Sanskrit and their enlightenment entered into the language with all its music, poetry and celebration. Sanskrit became luminous. Sanskrit is the most poetic and musical language in existence. Hence the sutras are in Sanskrit and can be defined at various levels. It is not the word is one dimension, it has many dimensions to add it to it. And depending on your growth, depending on your level of consciousness, by using the paraphrase, you can use the word at different levels of consciousness. Sanskrit sutras can be defined in many ways, can be commented upon in many ways. Indeed, they allow much playfulness. For example, there are 800 roots in Sanskrit and out of those 800 roots, Thousands of words have been derived, just as out of one root a tree grows and that particular tree has many branches and thousands of leaves and hundreds of flowers. Each single root becomes a vast tree with great foliage. For example, let us take a root Ram. It can mean many things. It can mean to be calm, to rest, to delight in, cause delight to, to make love, to join, to make happy, to be blissful, to play, to be peaceful, to stand still, to stop, to come to a full stop and God divine the Absolute. Indeed, these are only a few of the meanings of the rule. Sometimes the meanings are related to one another. Sometimes not. And other times even they are contradictory to each other. Hence language has multidimensional quality to it. You can play with those words and through that play 
you can express the inexpressible. The inexpressible can be hinted. And this is the beauty of the language. And significantly, the Sanskrit language is called Devani, the divine language. And it certainly is divine in this sense because it is more poetic and most musical language. Each word has a certain music around it, a certain aroma. It happened because so many people used it that was full of inner harmony. Of course, those words become luminous. They are used by people who are enlightened. Something of their light filtered into the words, reached to the very core of the words. Something of their silence entered into the grammar, the very language they were using. Upanishads say that the world is the manifest form of God and God is the unmanifest form of the world. And very and every manifest phenomenon has an unmanifest embedded into it. The form and formless are always together. It is in this background, it is in this background that I speak to you on various aspects, a religion, without God, a religion that does not need God. So far, all your religions are God-oriented. You are very important. The emphasis will be no more on God. Instead, it's shifted from God to man, who has all along been sitting on the periphery and God remain the center. When man is the center and periphery, he has no more excuses. All responsibility of transformation is his. The master plays an important role in this process of providing direction that he remains on track. With this in mind, various topics, overflows will be spoken on. Some of these were not explained before. Indeed, religion without God is the beginning of the religion of meditation. Meditation is an individual process free of all dogmas and philosophies, one simply is. One is not doing anything, no thinking, no one is feeling anything. This ishness is the ultimate experience of bliss. Beyond this there is nothing. This is eternal search. You have a right to whom? Though meditation begins in mind, but it is not real. You have to begin with the mind and one day you will attain to meditation. When the mind ceases, you are beyond it. Only then the real process begins. Even to go beyond the mind, you have to use the mind itself because mind is the vehicle. And when you reach, you have to abandon that. To use the mind negatively, you can certainly attain to that state which is needed. And when you have attained to meditation, 
Certainly one day your illness explodes into myriad ways. Many flowers blossom and their beauty and fragrance begins to fill your innerness and then it manifests in the outer realm. Deep within there is an explosion of song and dance and on the periphery there is celebration. Nobody sees what has caused this celebration. Celebration everybody sees. But the explosion of song within, the explosion of bliss within, nobody sees it. Inner beauty then assumes the form of words, pure, sacred, sublime, and yet beyond time and space, yet beyond. It is the inner beauty that assumes the form of words, pure, sacred and sublime, yet beyond time and space.